Welcome to the Disruptive by Design podcast from Signal Media. Signal is the official news outlet of FC International. And hello, I'm Kimberly Underwood, the Director of Digital News Media at Signal. For those of you who don't know Disruptive by Design, the podcast features folks from our emerging leader community, individuals 40 years and younger, as well as leaders of any age that we see being beneficial to know about for our emerging leaders. From our membership team, I do have an ask. Since FCA's Emerging Leaders Program is for those individuals 40 years and younger, we need you to update your birth year in your membership profile. This enables us to help unlock your access to program benefits, invitations, and resources that our team designed specifically for young professionals. For example, at our major AFSIA events, such as TechNet Cyber in Baltimore, which is coming up in June, we may have specific programs or events just for emerging leaders. So you'll want to have your profile updated so you can re receive any information. So to do this, you'll log into the afsia.users.membersuite.com slash home, which is our member portal. Again, that is afsia, A-F-C-E-A dot users dot member suite dot com slash home and then go ahead and update your birth year under my info and we'll also add a link below. In this episode of Disrupted by Design, I spoke with Luke Johnson from Circe. Luke is truly someone who is disrupted by design. He's a great young mind that thinks outside the box and is willing to try and advance new areas of science. Really groundbreaking. He graduated recently from University of Chicago with a degree in neuroscience, and he's interested in going to medical school. So he talks a little bit about his journey on that. He also helped research the field of synodics, which involves microdosing of psychedelics. And this is a really important emerging field, especially for traumatic brain injuries or PTSD um, military related injuries. Currently, Luke is the operations director for the Cognitive Immun Immunology sorry, Research Collaborative, or CIRCE. So it's C-I-R-C-E. And this is a great organization based in Pittsburgh. We'll add a link as well for that. They are advancing ways to combat misinformation and disinformation by increasing one's immunity to misinformation and disinformation. They are a great resource, so definitely check that out. So Luke talks about his role there. And in general, he just offers us a lot to consider in areas that are new and emerging. I can't wait to see where science and medicine will take him, and we're all lucky for his passion and what will be his future contributions. And with that, welcome to, to Disrupted by Design with Luke Johnson. Hello, welcome to this episode of Disrupted by Design. I'm here with Luke Johnson. Hello, Luke. Hi, Kim. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for joining me. I, I really appreciate it. And um, could you give us a brief in introduction about who you are? Sure. Yeah. So my name is Luke Johnson, uh, and I work as the operations director for the Cognitive Immunology Research Collaborative, or CIRCE for short. And uh, you might also know us by the Mental Immunity Project, which is um, kind of one of our our main avenues of work. Um, and uh, yeah, I graduated from the University of Chicago last year. Um, I'm actually a pre-medical student, so I'm kind of uh, working in an interesting job as a pre-medical student, not, not necessarily uh, medically related, but it's sort of a side passion um, of mine. And yeah, I really enjoy the work that we do with Circe, and I'm excited to share about it. Right. Yeah, it's a fascinating organization and I think very important in this day and age. How did you first get involved with Cersei? How did you learn about it and how, how did you, um, I guess, move into your position? Yeah, so it's kind of there's kind of a fun story there. So I, I um, was in at the University of Chicago, you have to do a year of a social sciences course. And the one I took is called self um it's, it's generally just called self, but I think the full name is like self culture and society. Um, and we were reading uh, Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And I was writing my term paper on uh, this book about, 
it was kind of a, you know, foundational theory of how science works. Um, and is kind of the source of, uh, the, the idea of like scientific paradigms and paradigm shifts, which, um, people kind of use the phrase, uh, paradigm sh shift pretty commonly a quote colloquially and that's kind of where that phrase comes from and at the time I had also like just coincidentally been listening to Andy's book mental immunity where he kind of lays out um, his own uh, paradigm for uh, cognitive sciences and thinking of the mind as having a, an immune system for processing uh, new ideas and information and so uh I wanted to have an example in my, in my essay of like sort of a, a scientific revolution of sorts or a new paradigm. And so I reached out to Andy and was like, Hey, I'm writing this essay uh, about this book. I'm sure you know about the book and I want to, you know, sort of incorporate your work as a sort of example of, of a modern uh, paradigm shift. And uh, he was like super, super like interested in talking with me and sharing with me. And I was, I kind of like, we kind of had an email exchange and I, um, followed up and was like, Hey, if you ever like need a research assistant or anything like that, I was, I never thought it was going to lead to anything. And then he actually happened to follow up a few months later and I started working uh, with him on Circe in the fall of 2022. And so now I've been with uh, the org for a little over a year and a half now. Yeah. Right. Sure. And, um, Andy Norman, is the founder of Circe and um, he really looks at, yeah, like what, as you're mentioning, a paradigm shift that the mind has an immune system that you can build up mental immunity, which I think is so important this in this day and age of disinformation and misinformation. And so it's a fascinating organization with all sorts of tools and resources for people. And it's so great that you spent the last year researching. Can you talk a little bit about some of the research you've done um, over the last year? Sure. Yeah. So Andy likes to say that we are translational researchers. So um, we we try to find pre-existing research and people doing important work that sort of connects to um, the theory that he's developing um, and communicate that to the public and sort of fit it into this framework um, to develop, you know, useful tools and concepts that people can use. Um, we do do, um, or we do have sort of some, uh, more, uh, direct research, I guess you could say going on with, uh, a collaborator at the university of Toronto. So Andy has a, a survey that he developed that we're trying to validate, which is designed to, to measure mental immunity and sort of, uh, establish it as a more validated and sort of rigorous, um, psychological construct that you can measure. Um, so hopefully there'll be some more progress there in the short-term future or like, yeah, pretty, pretty soon we're hoping. Um, and I guess probably the, the most significant sort of, uh, translational research or like review research that we've done was writing this paper called, um, do minds have immune systems? And so this is available as a preprint right now. And if you just search, do minds have immune systems, Andy Norman, um, it'll probably come up. I think it's on the social science research network. So you probably add like SSRN to the, the end of the search and that should come up. Uh, we co-authored that with uh, Sander Vanderlinden, who is uh, just kind of a, a tank of a researcher um, out, out of Cambridge University. He's done a lot of, uh, very, very impactful research in the field of psychological inoculation. So this is um, sort of an area of psychological research that is very integral to cognitive immunology. And the general idea is there is that if you, you know, present people with misinformation and preemptively show how it's flawed when they hear it again or hear similar arguments, then they'll be less likely to be persuaded by those, um, those arguments. So. Right. Yeah. Sure. And why else is cognitive, cognitive immunity so important? Um, and you're kind of, you mentioned how, you know, you can kind of train your mind in that sense to not believe things. Um, but why, why do you see that it's important in this day and age? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty young, so I don't have so much life experience, but I've been told that we live in unprecedented, unprecedented times. You know, uh, recently I was reading an article about, um, I think it came from NewsGuard and they track how many, uh, AI generated like misinformation or disinformation sites there are and it's like reaching like the, into the thousands and only like uh a year or two ago like these, this sort of thing of a AI generated fake news site would like probably wasn't even possible um so um and social you know social media is so big in everybody's lives like our my generation especially mostly gets its our news off of social media and there's been plenty of studies showing how prevalent misinformation and uh you know pseudoscience and just kind of like propaganda and false false um, information is on these platforms so um it's crucial that our society in order to not you know be extremely polarized and be kind of everybody having their own uh, view on reality based on whether or not like what kind of information they're getting. It's, it's crucial that we learn how to discern truth from um, all the, the sources of information that are coming at us. So, um, you know, we're really grounded in trying to teach people um, scientific thinking skills, practical philosophy, um, logic and, you know, those sorts of very, um, I mean, very, it's very, it's kind of a new framing of very old ideas of how, you know, how, just how to think, uh, correctly. Like one thing that we really like to talk about is the power of uh, Socratic questioning. Andy loves, um, kind of just like that core philosophy of using questions to get people to, to think more critically about, um, the information that they're receiving. And, uh, so, um, the framework of cognitive immunology uh, on one on one side of things it is trying to develop a new field of research um, and a new um, sort of paradigm in the sciences but on the other side of things it's also just a very practical way of um, trying to get people to uh, think think more clearly and kind of um, think um, as a as a unified sort of society about what it, what is true if that makes sense <laughs> hey sure absolutely i know from a reporter standpoint i you know hear reports out of the pentagon of how the governments of china and russia and iran are really using social media to try to and in some ways successfully you know interfere with our society you know by trying to change perceptions or and it's it it's for me, it seems very scary. So I'm glad to know that your organization, you know, is, is um, paving the way for this science and kind of bringing together, like you're saying, you know, research from before and then providing tools and an understanding. And, and um, I think that's so powerful. Yeah, thanks. And, and then I wanted to ask kind of, you know, a little bit about your background. How did you first get interested in science? and kind of these areas in science, I guess. Sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess from a pretty young age, like I always used to read uh, National Geographic Kids. So I, I always kind of had uh, a love for science and a love for learning. Um, I used to ask so many questions that my older brother would like get mad at me for asking too many questions. And uh so, you know, I knew I wanted to pursue, pursue a field, uh, like a career in science generally from a pretty young age. And uh, then I got really interested in, in psychology and neuroscience, like come um, like middle school, high school. And um, going into college, I decided to start a major in, in neuroscience just because I felt like um, it was more of a, like a rigorous approach to psychology and understanding the mind. And, uh, you know, I, I think there's a limitation to how much we can understand about human consciousness in the mind through, uh, neuroscientific methods, but, um, I, I do find it to be a fascinating field and, uh, I don't know. I feel like I have like very broad interests, which is kind of what led me to, um, kind of finding work with Cersei because it is kind of a very interdisciplinary sort of 
um, area of work. And, and, you know, it's, we're really focused on trying to help people uh, discern truth, which is like a very, you know, broad uh, topic and uh, kind of is very close to close to my own heart and kind of like trying to make sense of the world. So, yeah. Right. Sure. And what's up for you next? I think you have some plans in the works. <laughs> yeah. So um, I am waitlisted at two different medical schools right now. Um, and kind of, you know, unsure if I'll get in or not. And so, I mean, I'm kind of okay with that. I know how competitive uh, it is to get in. I think only 30% of students who apply end up getting in anywhere. So um, I knew this was sort of a, a possibility. So I'm kind of preparing for plan B's if I don't end up going to medical school this year, um, looking at um, kind of biostatistic master's degrees, potentially master's in public health, um, different uh, jobs and, and sorts as I work uh, part-time for Cersei. So um, kind of exploring my options. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities for my, my future right now, but um, I think that excites me more than anything. I mean, it is somewhat stressful, but um, such is life, I guess. <laughs> hey, sure. And I, when I talked to you before, I think you had just done one of your interviews for med school. Can you talk a little bit about the process? You, if anybody out there is interested in um, you know, applying to med school, what, what what is it like? What's the process like? Yeah, so, I mean, I, th I think it's a very, um, it's a long process and a very kind of, there's a lot of things you need to do to make sure that you really want to do it, you know? So you have to take the MCAT, um, which is like, I, b I believe it's like an eight hour test. I actually took it four years ago now, um, but it has a, a biology section, a chemistry section, um, psychological, social sciences section, and a reading and writing section, each of which are, yeah, like two hours. Um, and I, yeah, the reason I, I took it four years ago now, because that was uh, the summer after my second year of college. And uh, around that time, I thought I was going to be trying to go sort of straight through uh, medical school is what they kind of call it, like applying during your third year of college um, or during, yeah, kind of end of your third year, beginning of your fourth year and going straight into medical school. But I ultimately, uh, took a gap year during COVID, um, ended up not applying again the next year. Cause I kind of wanted to get more research experience as around that time I was uh, considering trying to do an MD PhD, uh, kind of dual degree. And so, yeah, I, I ended up applying pretty late after my MCAT, which means you can only apply to so many schools because a lot of the schools want you to have that test score, um, you know, not, not too old. And um, you have a primary application where you, which you submit to a bunch of schools and then most schools will automatically give you um, a secondary application, which is where they ask you their own questions. The primary application is mostly kind of covering your resume and uh, was where your personal statement is. And then when you get your secondaries, you, you know, have to write short essays for each school, which, so it's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated process or it's just like a very, uh, it's an intense process, I guess, because you, you need to apply to at least, I applied to 15 schools, which is actually on the lower end. I think a lot of people apply to 20, 25, even upwards of 30 or 40. And so it's a lot of writing and the timing is important. Um, I think I actually got my applications in too late, which didn't, didn't help me a whole lot. And, uh, but I, I'm pretty committed to, to taking that path. And so uh, I'm, I'm fine with having to do the tests again and applying again. So, yeah. Right. Sure. Well, you're a lovely writer. I do know that. And uh, oh, thank you. So I wish you well on, you know, if you do have to reapply, um, I know you have a lot to offer the medical community. Can you talk a little bit about synodics, what that is and your interest in that? I thought that was fascinating too. Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess like one side of my interest we haven't really talked too much about is uh, psychedelic research. So 
I got really fascinated in uh, this sort of burgeoning area of, of research, um, actually late in high school. Um, I was experiencing some depression and anxiety around that time and was just like, well, what is, what, what is out there? What, like what research exists? Like what is like, cause I'd learned about SSRIs, their limitations and, and stuff like that. And, um, I just happened to start reading about this area of research and it was really pretty good timing because 2017, 2018 is when, um, a, a lot of this started getting a, a lot more media attention and it's only sort of grown since then. So, uh, you know, ar around that time, not many people really knew about research on psychedelics. I think um, they still had a lot of stigma around them, um, but that that has really shifted quite a lot in quite a fascinating way that I think a lot of people in the field didn't expect. So um, when I started learning about this, I decided to go to a, um, a research conference to really kind of get more in depth. And that was at UCLA in the summer of 2018. And uh, my my dad... Uh, bless his heart because I think most <laughs> most uh most dads if their son came to them and said hey you want to take me to a, a psychedelic research conference out in LA uh would be like no what the hell um, no <laughs> you shouldn't be thinking about this as an 18 year old boy but um he's a doctor he you know he understands uh research and it was kind of open to to learning about this and so as sort of a graduation uh treat he was planning on taking me on a uh of like a road trip or traveling somewhere. So we went out to LA and uh, yeah, I got really interested in this area of research and talked to one of the, so Johns Hopkins has one of the biggest sort of research groups in psychedelics and uh, talked to um, Stephen Barrett after his talk and was like, Hey, I'm going to U Chicago and really want to, you know, work in this field. Who should I reach out to? And he just said, Harriet DeWitt, like, Harriet Witt. <laughs> it was like a pretty simple answer, like reach out to her. And I was like, all right, I'll, I'll check that out. And uh, so I got really lucky. I um, got into Harriet Witt's lab, which is like my preferred lab to work in my, right away, kind of early on in my first year of college. Um, it wasn't a, a psychedelic study, but it was a, a THC study. Some people consider THC a psychedelic um, it's an int interesting debate, but yeah, THC cannabis research, essentially, um, helping out a PhD student with her, uh, dissertation research on T THC. So this is with, uh, with human subjects, um, giving them THC or placebo it's double blind. So we didn't know, um, kind of an interesting, <laughs> interesting thing to participate in, you know, you're coming into the lab, somebody else is coming in to participate and, you're giving them a pill. You don't know what, what's in it. They don't know what's in it. Um, you have an idea of what it could be. They really have no idea. And having them do a bunch of surveys and uh, psychological tests and uh, tasks over the course of you know, five, six hours. And uh, yeah, I learned a lot about sort of um, how research works. That was a very foundational experience for me. Um, so I worked in that lab um, my first and second years of college and then uh, COVID happened and I went home and uh, always had wanted to kind of get back into the lab, but um, there was a lot of other things that kind of came up in life. And, uh, but that was, that was a great experience for me learning how um, research works. And that is where I met. So <laughs> finally getting back to Synodics, that is where I met Connor Murray because in the summer after my first year, when I was working full-time in that lab, he had just started his um, postdoctoral fellowship um, after finishing his PhD. And he um, he's really interested in uh, cannabis research, THC, trying to understand uh, the psychedelic properties of, of cannabis and also trying to understand how uh, cannabis um, affects um, adolescents and younger adults, uh, in different ways than, than, uh, older adults. And so that was 2019. We met, we kind of became friends. He was kind of a mentor to me in the lab, kind of teaching me uh, his research and how, how he works. And then COVID happened. And, uh, I reached out to him when I decided to get gap year and he, he was working on synodics. It was kind of when it started during the pandemic because he wanted to continue doing research, but was really limited by 
the fact that at that time, you know, you couldn't have uh, research subjects come in for um, for a sort of basic science research that wasn't really um, essential, you know. So he wanted to develop this app for doing remote research. And essentially the idea was, um, you know, it's a matter of fact that people use these substances in their own time, but there's a lot of data that isn't collected on um, on their experiences. And so Synotics was kind of born as a, a trip reporting app. Honestly, um, Connor wanted to just have, have that out there for people to write their thoughts down from psychedelic experiences and try to learn from the, from these, uh, from like kind of a vast collection of text through, uh, natural language processing. Uh, and I mean, we had a, a, an MVP sort of app that was developed, um, wasn't ever really officially launched. We want, we, we were really sort of cognizant about, um, kind of doing it right, you know, putting an app out there for people who are on drugs can be a very ethically <laughs> kind of dicey area, right? Um, but it was a good learning experience. We went through like an accelerator program called i which is a National Science Foundation thing that they have at a lot of different universities. And we, we went through um, uh, UChicago's program. And, but eventually we pivoted more to, uh, to doing uh, remote EEG research. And uh, in the next sort of year in 2021, I sort of stepped away from the projects. I went back to school and, but Connor has still been uh, working on Synotics as sort of a, uh, uh, his own sort of research project. So he sends out EEG headbands to people who are, you know, I think mostly our people are microdosing and they want to understand how uh, microdosing LSD or psilocybin or uh, whatever it may be um, is affecting them. And so Connor kind of does this sort of bespoke uh, research for, for people. It's not really a money, money generating thing. It's just kind of a, a hobby, but it, it um, to my understanding, actually I've been in contact with Connor recently. He's uh, reestablishing Synotics as, um, as a company because it's gotten a lot of interest in the last few years and sort of, uh, making it more of a business entity kind of gives it a lot more potential to, uh, do more cool stuff, I guess. So, yeah, kind, right, of, kind sure. of a lot there for, yeah. if anybody's unfamiliar with psychedelics, that might all be kind of confusing. So, but Right. Yeah. It's definitely a burgeoning and emerging um, area of research. And I love that you're kind of at the forefront of that cutting edge research. And I know from the military community, a lot of people with, you know, traumatic brain injuries and PTSD, this might, yeah. you know, offer some solutions for them. So I think it's very promising for sure. And yeah. my other question was kind of, do you have any advice for, you know, younger people coming up who may be interested in science or trying things, um, you know, what can you offer from your perspective? Yeah, uh, we live in interesting times. I feel like who knows what, how AI will affect our futures. And I think, um, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty in the future. And I think my, my generation and uh, so Gen Z and, and Gen Alpha coming up, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, mental health issues and, and struggles that people people deal with. Um, and so I guess thinking about that as that's kind of a something that's really important to me, I guess my advice would be to develop good habits of, of mind that kind of uh, keep you keep you sane, I guess, um, and keep you mentally well. Um, you know, I, at U Chicago, which has a reputation of where fun goes to die. I <laughs> made friends with a lot of people that really struggled in a lot of different ways, um, uh, mentally, um, whether that be depression, anxiety, um, psychosis, even, um, addictions and, and sorts. Um, I think, uh, the, the best thing that you can do um, is really just develop good lifestyle habits and have kind of have your a, a, a firm a footing in, in life and a kind of a, a solid foundation where whatever it may be that you're facing, whatever uncertainties you have, like 
you kind of kind of have your own habits um, set straight, you know, getting good sleep, eating well, exercising, uh, those sorts of like moving, um, just getting good lifestyle habits will just help so much and creating a solid foundation for, for your mind and your well being. So I think that's super important, uh, regardless of what you're doing in life. So, yeah. Right. It seems simple, but that is at the core of, of of mental health and health. Um, so yeah, that's great advice. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else you wanted to add or highlight? Um, no, not really. I guess, um, I want to invite people if they're interested in Cersei's work to reach out to us, especially uh, school teachers. We're trying to develop uh, lessons and and sort of tools for the classroom. So if you're interested in uh, you know helping your students think more clearly, being more critical thinkers, um, dealing with misinformation that's out there, uh, we want to help you. And yeah, anybody who wants to maybe collaborate or work with us or is more interested in our work, uh, just. C I R C E or cognitive immunology.net or mental immunity project.org, um, or even just search Andy Norman, the founder. Um, you should be able to find our stuff pretty easily. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, my work email is just Luke at cognitive immunology.net. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, that's great, Luke. Thanks so much. And we'll put some links up as well. Um, but thanks for walking through all that and sharing your experience. I really appreciate it. I love the perspective that you offer. Thank you so yeah, much. Thanks. I appreciate it. It was fun, fun to share. Yeah, yeah thank you. And good luck with your, all your efforts. Thanks, Kim. Yeah, thanks.